Our speaker this morning is somebody that you as Northwood students uh, should know. It's Dr. Timothy G. Nash. He's been at Northwood uh, first as a student and later as an administrator, a professor, and now uh, one of the officers at Northwood University. There's very little good that happens at Northwood University that Tim Nash has not had some role in. Uh, he is a fantastic asset to our institution. Uh, when I meet alumni who have had him as a teacher, they remember him fondly. He's won many teaching awards. Uh, he's done um, recently uh, edited a newsletter, a financial newsletter that is widely circulated. Um, he makes public appearances, lectures, uh, radio and TV, and uh, he's he's. Uh, well, let me tell you some of his academic credentials. Uh, he uh, received his BBA from the University of Northwood, his master's degree from Central Michigan University, and his doctorate from Wayne State University. He is an associate professor of economics and public policy at the DeVos Graduate School, and he's the David E. Fry Professor of Free Enterprise and the Vice President of Strategic and Corporate Alliances at Northwood University. So please welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Timothy G. Nash. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate that. Please. And, he, and he almost read it the way I wrote it. Well, thank you, Dale. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is, uh, it's my honor to be here with you this morning. I remember when we did the first uh, Freedom Seminar almost, uh, almost 35 years ago. And uh, believe it or not, my wife was in elementary school and, and, and I was a student. And uh, those of you that are from Midland, uh, the, the, the person that actually started the Freedom Seminar, Larry Reed, went on and uh, uh, was the chair of the economics department, uh, was in Dr. Matchek's role at the time. And then he went on and started the, uh, the Mackinac Center. And today he runs the Foundation for Economic Education. And th this is a, this seminar is a tradition that really goes all the way back to somebody you may or may not know if uh, if you remember from When We Are Free, the, the book that uh, uh, Dr. Matchek and I co-authored, co-edited, that Milton Friedman wrote the foreword to. In, in my opinion, Milton Friedman is probably the greatest economist of the 20th century right there with, uh, with Friedrich von Hayek. But what you may or may not know is that there's a very famous organization called the Mont Pelerin Society. And these were a bunch of free market economists that met in Mont Pelerin, Switzerland uh, in the late 1940s because they were worried that the world was moving towards socialism, that uh, free markets and free enterprise and entrepreneurship and capitalism would be done away with. Uh, Winston Churchill, who had bravely led uh, the British Empire through World War II, had been defeated. The, the socialist movement had taken control of the parliament in, in England and in many other European countries. And so these free market economists met, 37 of them, to try to come up with ideas and systems and processes and means of education to beat back the, the, uh, uh, the socialist movement, the communist movement that was taking root in Europe and literally around the world. Milton Friedman was there, Friedrich von Hayek was there, and our own Dr. V. Orville Watts was one of the 37 um, founding members of the Mont Pelerin Society. So, when you, you think about it, the ideas, the idea of educating people about the goodness, the morality, the decency, and the productivity of a free economy goes back long before the Mont Pelerin Society, but we, we looked at and thought about that meeting that took place over 60 years ago in Switzerland, and, and we said, uh, you know, we ought to be doing a seminar that continues to express these ideas, challenges the ideas. And so, the purpose of the Freedom Seminar is for, for all of you young people in the room, but some of us that are a little bit older as well, is, is to hear ideas, to listen to speakers, to challenge those ideas, and to make certain that uh, if, if you feel that there are holes in, in the philosophy or, or in the, the economic thought process, make certain that you voice your opinions, that you debate, that you question, and that as you go through this, this seminar and into the future, that you constantly challenge your beliefs 
Because if you want them to be transformational, you have to make certain that you are very comfortable with who you are, what you are, what you believe, and then hopefully you become a champion of it. Because my, my, my last general comment before I start with my remarks is that uh, another very famous economist, uh, his name is Joseph Schumpeter. He wrote a, a, a wonderful book called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And paraphrasing Dr. Schumpeter, Schumpeter was the founder of the Lausanne School in Lausanne, Switzerland, very close to Mont Pelerin. He spent uh, most of his major academic career at Harvard University. He uh, did tremendous work on entrepreneurship. He was a leading uh, scholar in the area of the business cycle, what caused the trade cycle, or the malinvestment theory of, of the business cycle, what caused recessions and depression what caused recessions and depressions, sorry. And the interesting part with regard to Schumpeter, again, paraphrasing him, he said basically capitalism has fed more people, clothed more people, raised the standard of living of more people than all economic systems in the history of the world combined. But it would sow the seeds for its own destruction for those who benefit most from capitalism know not how to defend it. And there he wasn't talking about politicians, he wasn't talking about individuals, he wasn't talking about consumers, he was talking about business people. He was arguing that business people had a noble calling, but that they had to go out there and defend that noble calling. And so I want you to think about that as I, as I go through my remarks. What Schumpeter said and how as you look at what Schumpeter said, how can we translate that into a call for action to be better business leaders? Because you know, I've, I've been at Northwood University, been blessed to be here for almost 35 years after I graduated. And when I look at where we are today, the, the, just the minimal time I had to uh, be with you last night uh, to be there for my, my good friend Maurice McTeague's talk, and, and to watch how he resonated with all of you, I, I think that this country is in wonderful hands. And if I think that it, as you follow in the footsteps of other Northwood alumni, you, know, you may or may not know, but uh, it is true. I've done some of the studies. 25% of Northwood graduates own some or all of their own business 10 years after graduation. We have numerous Fortune 500 executives, both at the publicly traded companies and the privately traded companies. And you are going to go out there, you are going to make a difference. If you look at the GDP of the businesses that Northwood University students, graduates own and run, if it were a country, it would be in the top 150 countries in the world. That's the kind of businesses that Northwood University alums and graduates own. You know, if you think of those of you that are from the Detroit area, the Lear Corporation, Bob Rossiter just stepped down uh, as chairman and CEO of Lear, they do $20 billion a year. There are countries, when you look at Zimbabwe that uh, 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 Maurice uh, was mentioning last night, Zimbabwe's GDP for the entire country isn't much larger than that. You look at uh, uh, Jimmy Coons uh, out of uh, Virginia, he owns the Coons Automotive Group, 35 dealerships, they do over a billion dollars worth of new and used car sales. Dark Cars, uh, another group out of uh, the Baltimore, uh, Washington, D.C. area, the same thing. And the list goes on and on and on. And so what I would say to you today is that being a business person is one of the great callings, both from a religious and certainly from an economic perspective. But understanding how it works, why the free market system works, and what that means to you in terms of profits, here at Northwood, profit's not a dirty word. Profit is something to be emulated. It is something to be used wisely. But simultaneously, what I think is important is that your employees feel a sense of empowerment, that your employees feel a sense of belonging, that your employees feel that they have been a key contributor to the success that you have in your business. So what Schumpeter was really saying is, if your employees win along with you as a business leader, they will be your greatest champions. And when the government comes after the 1% and says you don't pay enough in taxes, you don't, uh, 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 you, you don't do enough, 
those employees will stand up and say, wait a minute, I have a job because of my boss. I have a job because she is leading my company in a way that uh, uh, makes us exceptional. I have profit sharing. I have bonuses. I've been able to send my children to college. I've been able to pay for a wedding. I've been able to volunteer and support the Little League team and write them a check when they ask for it. I support the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, my local synagogue, my local church, my local mosque. That's what capitalism allows, and that's what's important today. That as a business person, you're not just a champion of your business and profits, but you're a champion of the entire process, and most importantly, the employees that work for you and with you. All right, with that in mind, um, I'd like to start out and clarify a couple of things because I think that um, in the economics profession, those of us that are purveyors of the dismal science, um, we, we sometimes give you a lot of data and maybe we confuse you. So I, I, was, uh, I opened the German Automotive uh, World Congress. I was the keynote speaker a couple of years ago, and one of uh, my friends that introduced me from Germany, he, he told this little story, and I thought, well, it, it, this kind of makes sense when it comes to economics and data. So he was telling the story about this economist who was in Frankfurt and decided to go for a walk out in the country. So the economist is walking down this country road, and he comes along this large farm. And in the pen, in front of the, uh, uh, of the, the main barn, there was this whole major flock of sheep that had gathered in that area. So the economist, you know, he's, he's a great mathematician and he's looking at the flock and the farmer walks up and says, sir, what are you doing? And the farmer doesn't know what this gentleman does and the, the economist looks at the farmer and he says, I'm counting your flock. And he says, sir, they're, they're so close together, there's so many of them, there's no way that you can tell me how many sheep are there. The economist looks at him and says, there are 940, he says, hmm, and then he backs up and he says, no, and the farmer looks at him and says, if you can guess the number, I'll give you one of them. So the economist takes one more look and he says, there's 969 sheep. The farmer looks at him and says, my God, you're right. He said, that's incredible. How do you do that? And he says, well, I run an algorithm through my mind and I take the second derivative of the, of the flock. He says, well, he says, um, you're, he said, a bet's a bet. Um, choose whichever one you want. So the economist leans over, he picks up an animal, and he waves goodbye to the farmer, and he starts walking down the road. And the farmer says, sir, double or nothing. I'll bet I can guess what you do for a living. So the economist is thinking in his mind, there's, there's, there's no way. He'll, he'll never guess. He'll think I'm a mathematician or something. He says, all right, great. Farmer looks at him and says, you're an economist. And the farmer says, or the economist says, well, huh, how did you know that, that, how did you guess that I'm an economist? He says, well, he said, if you put my dog down, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, 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 that went over big in Germany. Uh, the, the point is that when you, you look at the macro, when you look at the total numbers, the real question is do you look at the individual impact or, or, or the individual effect? And I think that that's, that's important for you to, to think about and look at as we go through uh, uh, this particular presentation. Uh, this is the work, as you saw on the first uh, uh, slide, of uh, myself, Dr. Ebling, Dr. Pretty, and Adam Motsky. I'm sure a lot of you know who Adam is. Our, valedictorian this year. He's a young man that I've had the honor and privilege of working with uh, for the last three years and I'm going to miss him a lot. Great, uh, great research uh, uh, person and uh, an individual that um, I tried to get to go to grad school so I could have him for another year. As you look at can capitalism and the American dream survive, I think it's important for us to start out with the general macro flow. Now I think all of you have the handout and uh, so all these slides you'll see right in front of you, you can follow them on the screen, take a look at the handout. If you'd like to share this with others, this is available on the Northwood website under white papers. Uh, you can send this electronically to anyone. 
and uh, somebody could download and, and print it as a booklet as well. But here, the, the, the first question that I think we all have to ask about economics is if we believe in the basic macro flow, we say that we have households, we have government, and we have business. And so a major question that we have to ask is, what are the, the key factors or what are the most important variables within the macro flow? And so in other words, if you ask the question, where does the productivity in the economy come from? Now, first and foremost, I'll start out and tell you that I'm not an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, I believe in government. I believe that there is a very important role for government in any economy. Uh, the argument that I would make with you today is that I just think that government is too large today and that it is something that curtails the other two variables in the macro flow. So in other words, when I asked, when I was used to have the privilege of teaching principles of economics, I would ask students, where does, if you were imagining a simple society, where does productivity come from? Where are the dollars generated that allow businesses to exist, that allow households to exist, that allows government to exist? What is it that government produces? And at base, most of the students would go through and look at it and argue, well, government really doesn't produce anything in, in the sense of generating revenue. It provides important services like defense, like the police force, like the courts. It certainly is involved in, either through the courts or other means, litigating disputes. In certain cases, setting boundaries as to how society operates. But that is something that has to be paid for very important part of the economy. So then when you look at households, how are households funded? Some people have businesses in their homes, but then it, it gets a little blurry because is that a business or is that a home? And so what we actually come to grips with is that the cornerstone of the economy is business. And we actually want to argue that we have moral and ethical business. At Northwood University, when we talk about the Northwood idea, the definition is that business people are moral, that business people are ethical. And if they're not, then there certainly is a role for government to step in and to make certain that the behaviors that are unacceptable are changed. But the real question is, what is the key source of productivity of income, of wealth, and I think it, it's pretty obvious that it's business. And I remember uh, my, my dear friend uh, Dale Haywood, I, I don't know if any of the students in the room ever had a chance of meeting Dr. Haywood. He was um, he's a guy that I, <clears throat> if I talk too long, I um, won't be able to finish my talk, but um, uh, Dale's one of my heroes. Uh, he was a um, just, just a wonderful, wonderful human being. He was a brilliant uh, economist, finance guy. And uh, he died a few years ago of brain cancer. And um, uh, Dale was Mr. Northwood. Dale, Dale was the, the epitome, the embodiment of the Northwood idea. And he had this, like Milton Friedman, he had this great ability to take a complex issue and, and to make it um, easily understood by everyone. And so when somebody would ask Dr. Haywood, what is your definition of freedom? Now, I always argue Dale was a bit of an anarcho-capitalist. I think Dale at, at root thought, you know, government, even if it consumed 3% of GDP, was probably a little bit too large. And Dale's, and, and Dale's definition was, if you asked him, what is complete freedom? What, what is the, the ideal free society? And he would stand up there and he'd say, Tim, if you earn a dollar, Complete freedom is you get to keep a dollar. And obviously the argument there is no taxes at all. But he said, I, I would be happy if, if uh, at all levels I earned a dollar and government took no more than 10 cents. So I guess in, a, in an imperfect world with human beings running it, if you earned a dollar and you got to take home 90 cents, that would be a pretty free society, a pretty good society. Now, when Dr. Haywood would give talks like that in the 1990s into the 21st century, people would say, what a radical. 
You know, that, 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 that's a crazy thing. But I want you to keep that in mind uh, as I show you some additional slides. So the, the, the first slide is just to simply say to you that if the key to society, if government exists because of the productivity of business, it seems that we should make certain that business can function as effectively and efficiently and generate as much revenue and wealth so that we can have a strong, a healthy, a vibrant government, so that we can have strong and healthy and vibrant households, so that you can realize the American dream, which is for your kids to be better off than you were and your grandkids to be better off than your kids, etc. And I would submit to you today that that American dream is coming into question largely because instead of having a reverence for business, a respect for business, a healthy respect for business, with that notion that we're talking about moral and ethical capitalism, I would suggest to you today that instead of looking at business as the cornerstone, the catalyst of this great country, the greatest country in the history of the world, today we look at business people with great suspicion and we look at business people and we argue that somehow, some way, they have done the things that they've done in an immoral and an unethical way. And I would argue nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, this is uh, uh, some work that my, uh, uh, another good friend of mine, Michael Cox, who, who was our opening speaker on Thursday. Uh, Mike and I have worked on this. Uh, some of the ideas for it uh, are contained in, in When We Are Free, which uh, uh, hopefully all of you have you've read. And, and what, it, what it really says is that in a free society, it's this whole notion of Schumpeter's and Hayek's creative destruction. And what it really says in, in a free society, business people are only successful. Business people are governed. Business people are regulated by the marketplace. And what we mean by the marketplace is we mean by consumers like all of you gathered in this room. It's the consumer that decides whether Dow Chemical is here today or gone tomorrow. In most cases, you know, and, and maybe we'll have a little discussion about, I was going to say, it's the market, it's the consumer that decides whether General Motors is here today or gone tomorrow. Oops. Because sometimes, and in today's day and age, we have exceptions where the government steps in and bails out companies. And if you want to talk about that during Q&A, we certainly can. But generally speaking, it is the marketplace, and certainly in a free economy, it's the market that decides whether a company's here today or gone tomorrow. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that that's the most moral and ethical way of doing business. Why? Because the consumer wins. When somebody asks me, am I pro-union, I say no. But I add, I'm not anti-union either. If somebody says, are you pro-business? I say no. Are you anti-business? Absolutely not. The only thing that I can say to you is I'm pro-market and I'm pro-consumer. I want what is best for the consumer in the marketplace. And so when you think about it, if you did a study of the original Dow Jones Industrial Average, came out in the late uh, uh, 1800s, and Dr. Dow, no relation to the Dow Chemical Company, he was a mathematician, a statistician, he came up with a way of trying to predict the growth of the economy by looking at the top stocks in the, in the uh, uh, what he later called the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And only one of those original companies is still in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And the only company that was in it from the beginning is General Electric. All the other companies have either gone out of business, been bought out, or have shrunk in size relative to the market. If you looked at the Fortune 100 companies, the Forbes 100 companies of 1900, what you'd find out is only two of them are still in the Fortune 100 today. Why? Blame yourselves. Blame your parents. Blame your grandparents. Or maybe the word blame is inappropriate. Your decisions made a lot of these companies obsolete because you came up with better ideas and better products and you voted for them with your wallets. You said, I don't want these old products, I want these new products. The Ohio Matchbook Company was one of the top 100 companies in the United States in 1900. And so when you think about it today, 
The fact that if you look in one of the great families in Detroit, the Fisher family, they were one of the few companies that had this uncanny ability to go from one leading product to another leading product. The Fishers, if you ever uh, uh, see on the General Motors Coach Insignia, and there's a restaurant, the Coach Insignia, at the top of the uh, Renaissance Center. But that was the, that coach with the wheels, luxury uh, carriage, that was what the Fisher family produced. The Coach Insignia was literally their logo. And then the Fisher brothers and others got together with Alfred Sloan and they formed General Motors. And then they went from talking about the Fisher Carriage Company or the Fisher Coach Company to Body by Fisher because they were able to transform the company from producing carriages to producing the bodies uh, for the automobiles that General Motors produced. And so most of the companies that were producing carriages went out of business. One of the largest employers in the United States was a company out of Saginaw that had major operations in Milwaukee and in uh, Chicago, and it was a company called the Morley Companies. And they were at one point the world's largest producer of buggy whips. And there were a lot of people that lost their jobs. There were stockholders that lost their wealth because the carriage manufacturers, the buggy whip manufacturers, they said, no way, what is ever going to replace the carriage. And they looked at the early automobiles, these loud things that were literally driving around here in Dearborn when Henry Ford was an entrepreneur. They were smelly, they were unsafe, they weren't enclosed, if you remember the early Ford products. People said, no way, nobody's going to buy this. But they underestimated the entrepreneur, they underestimated this notion of creative destruction out with the old, in with the new, in with the better products. And so that literally is what has made the capitalist system great. Government doesn't judge, other business people, they're not the judge and the jury. It's all of you as consumers that decide whether a company is here today or gone tomorrow. And you think about all the different products in your lifetime. Uh, you know, everybody in this room could teach me a lot about technology and about how the evolution of technological products have come into play. I mean, I, I am just flat out amazed at what I can do with this PDA. That I, I, can, I can send with no wires at all. You know, email fascinated me. And then the fact that uh, you could do it wirelessly. You could do it anywhere in the world. That you could, you know, you could be in China or you could be in Switzerland and, and you could get a phone call, you could get a text message or an email instantaneously around the world, and, and people talked about that in the 50s and 60s, and, and there were individuals that would say, well, if you could ever do something like that, that, that's the work of Satan. How could something like that work? How could something like that happen? How can you have a voice coming out of a box when the telephone was invented? And so what, what's amazing is that we as consumers decide whether these products are successful or whether they're not. And it's that exceptional person that has that vision that this technology could work. And then oftentimes she or he teams up with an entrepreneur who, who comes up with this incredible idea, but the incredible idea can't be commercialized. And so they come up with an idea, they take it to bright business people like all the young people gathered in this room, and it's the idea, and it's the scientific process, and it's the ability to raise the capital, thus capitalism, and it's the ability to put the management process together to, do, to produce it profitably. And that's how we constantly transform this economy. And as you look at the process, if I asked you 1900, what was the life expectancy in the United States? What would you say? Anybody want to take a guess? If this were the year 1900, Okay, one person says 50s. Anybody else want to take a guess? Okay, 40s. All right, let me say this. The correct answer is somewhere between 40 and 50. 46 years of age. Today, what's the average life expectancy? How many? A little higher? A little higher? 83? 83 is absolutely correct. 
and, and growing. So you think about it, in 100 years, we've almost doubled our life expectancy. And a key part of that has been technology. A key part of it has been processing of food, producing better food in a much more quality-driven way, the pharmaceuticals, the medicines, etc. Uh, if you think about uh, a disease, the spread of disease, you know, not many people talk about this, but when those horses and buggies went down the streets, the horses did certain things in the street that uh, you know, aren't necessarily the kinds of things you'd like to have on a city street. And there were people that literally their job was to clean up after horses. But if you look at cities, look at some of the films of the great immigration waves of the late 1800s and the early 1900s. You know, as, as a horse and buggy went down the streets of New York, you couldn't say, you know, the government didn't say, hey, horse, you can't do that. You, you had real problems with uh, 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 the horse and, and the certain things that, that uh, those uh, animal species uh, left on the streets, and they were problematic as it, as it related to the spread of disease. One thing that the automobile did was it eliminated that. When people talk about the health benefits or you think of the pollution from automobiles, there's pollution from automobiles. And uh, we've done a very good job of dramatically reducing pollution from automobiles. But people forget about all the pollution and the health risks that existed in these idyllic times of horses and buggies. Th that was a major, major problem that existed. So what I think is important is that as you look at the calling of a business person, that business person, through the process of creative destruction, produces goods and services that are only successful if the marketplace deems them to be successful. So it is true, in a free economy, it's the consumer that decides whether you're here today or gone tomorrow. And so as you look through this, this particular cycle, this cycle of human progress, as Dr. Cox and I refer to it, what happens here is that the old companies go out of business because their ideas and their products are obsolete and new companies come in and take their place. But there's no guarantee that you're going to be a success and that you're going to be in the number one or in the lead position or profitable over time. The only companies that are successful or profitable over time are those that continue to work well Within the company, they have that esprit de corps I was talking about earlier. The company, the employees respect the leader. The leader shares in the success and the progress of the company. And even if you do all that, there's no guarantee that you're going to be successful unless you take care of the consumer. You need to provide the consumer with the best possible product at the most competitive price you need to get it to them on time and in a quality manner, and you need to constantly make certain that you are beating your competitors in terms of taking care of that, uh, that customer. And so the thing that I think is important is that when you look at the basics, that's what makes a free market system successful. And when we say to a company, we say to an industry, we're going to prevent you from failing, what we're really saying is we're going to add costs and inefficiencies to the system. And then when we say we are going to prevent you from failing, one of the great questions is who is God? Who decides who's going to fail and who's going to succeed? If it's not the marketplace, then you get into political problems. Why do you choose and save company A and not company B? What's the justification? Does it make sense? Does it add cost to the economy? Does it add inefficiencies? You then figure out, well, what was the political process that got this company bailed out? Maybe I should spend more time lobbying the government and lobbying the political process in Washington rather than spending my time and resources producing the best product for the largest number of consumers. Now, I, I think that is, as you look at this, this is um, something that um, uh, I, was, I was very privileged to to know Dr. Friedman and to know him fairly well, to spend time with both Milton and Rose. And uh, in the spirit of honesty, especially since Rabbi Sparrow's here, uh, this is all Dr. Friedman's uh, work. And um, uh, this is something that uh, I changed a little bit, updated. 
But Dr. Dr. Friedman, um, I miss him a lot. Uh, uh, since his passing, uh, uh, roughly eight years ago, uh, the the roughly six years ago, I'm sorry. The 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 world has lost a, a wonderful voice and a champion for freedom and free enterprise. But one of the things that Dr. Friedman was so eloquent about is the fact that in a free society like the United States, we didn't get it right from the beginning. You know, there, there, for somebody to say that um, the United States was this idyllic country that was founded in 1776, they're wrong. There were a lot of problems, and we still have problems as a nation. Slavery, wrong. Women not being able to vote, wrong. Prejudice against religious groups, wrong. My grandfather who came over from Poland had an utter disdain for Italian people. One of my best friends, still one of my best friends in the world, was in uh, mine and, and Pam's wedding. Talked to him on the way down here, Dennis DiPonio. My grandfather was mean to my buddy, Dennis DiPonio. My grandfather came over from Ostravinka, Poland, age 13, to escape conscription in the Russian army. The Russians had occupied northern Poland. This was still under the reign of the Tsars. And then the communists took over after the Bolshevik Revolution. My grandfather was never able to go back to Poland. He had hoped to bring relatives over, wasn't able to do that. But he, but he loved America. You know, this was this, this dream for him. And he, he had a successful career with Chrysler. But he had this disdain for Italians. And, and I, one time, we went over there and he found out Dennis was Italian and he wasn't wasn't kind to him and you know he never used words like WAP you know WAP was a was a, 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 a distasteful term because a, a lot of Italians allegedly came into the country without papers they were quote unquote the illegal aliens of their day and finally I said grandpa you can't be that way you can't treat Dennis. He's, he's my friend. I could not have come over to see you. He drove us over here. And, and he, he finally broke down. Now, my grandfather died at age 83. Tough old guy. He was 83, died of his seventh stroke. I probably contributed to it because he was in an old folks home after his fourth stroke and I would sneak in camel no filters for him. I'd open the window because there wasn't much he could do. And he would say, Timmy, your mom, your dad no good. I need cigarette. So I talked to the nurse. The nurse says, go for it. And so he was just this, this guy that I, I, I'm, you know, I get emotional talking about grandpa because he's the only grandparent I knew. And he was this really great, kind, loving guy. And, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd give you money, put it in your hand, and, you know, when you came to see him. And, and in every way, you have this, this wonderful beaming memory of your grandfather, but he, he just disliked Italians. I said, Grandpa, why do you dislike Italians? And finally, he told me the story. When he came over from Poland, his family, I, I don't know how wealthy they were. I've been back. I've, I've visited relatives in Poland. I shouldn't say I've been back. I've gone back for him. Uh, he died in 1976. I went to Poland in 87 and 89. And he was telling me the story finally about how his family had had their land uh, uh, um, seized by the Russian army. And they were, had a pretty good sized farm. And they knew the handwriting was on the wall, so they wanted their eldest son to come to the United States. So they took what money they could, put it in a suitcase, and his mother said, Yosef, Joseph, when you get to America, before you get off the boat, we bought you this beautiful new suit. You put the suit on and you go into the city and you look for a job. And here's my grandfather did exactly what his mom told him to do. He has one suit, he puts it on, and he's exiting, walking down the gangplank at Ellis Island, and there are a bunch of Italians. That was the previous wave of immigrants. 
You had the Irish, then you had the Italians, then you had the Poles. And he's walking down the gangplank, and there are a bunch of Italian guys up there. What do you think the Italian guys were doing? This is not, my wife doesn't like me telling this story. They were urinating on the poles as they were coming off the boat. So, you know, you, you, know, you see Eddie Murphy in Coming to America. You know, people think all these immigrants were welcome with, with, with open arms. And they were not welcomed in a kind way. And immigrants were not necessarily treated as well as one would like. The whole notion of go west, young man, what was coined at that time because uh, a lot of the immigrants couldn't find jobs in a very crowded New York or very crowded Boston, and they went west. So the reason why you have large Polish populations in Milwaukee and Chicago and in Detroit is because a lot of the immigrants came west because they didn't have family or, or the, the business. By, by that point, the cities were very crowded with previous waves of immigrants. So my grandfather had this dislike for Italians because this, this Italian, who he never met, other than the way that he met him, had ruined his suit. And they didn't have dry cleaners then uh, uh, to clean the suit the way that he would have liked. He went in and was turned down a couple of times for jobs. You know, think about a, a, a muggy New York uh, summer. And, 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 and he went in and explained this to me in great detail. And so my... Uh, my, my buddy Dennis says, well, I'll check, but I don't think that was one of my relatives that did that to your grandfather. And, and, and it was funny because by the end, my, my um, grandfather and Dennis became very good friends. But the point is that when you look at America, what I want you to understand is it's not a perfect country. It's not a perfect society. But what Dr. Friedman was trying to say with this slide is, there's a rule of law. There, there, there is a way of getting justice. There is a way of solving problems. Because this document called the Constitution allowed this imperfect country to become more perfect by saying that we are not a democracy. And, and that's something that, that you hear me on a regular basis. If somebody says, isn't it great to live in this democracy, I say, no. And they say, why not? I say, we do not live in a democracy. We live in a democratic republic. We live in a country that says the majority rules only if the issue is within the confines of this document we call the Constitution. If it's not within the confines of the Constitution, then the point is it's not an issue for the majority to deal with. So in essence, you can be alone and you can be right. And we also said that this document called the Constitution was imperfect. The Founding Fathers knew that they didn't have everything right. They debated a lot of issues and never settled on all of them. But they argued into the future these issues would be settled by the amendment process. And it's how we eliminated slavery. It's how women got the right to vote. It's how we protected minorities. It's how we said you could be Catholic or Jewish or Muslim and the majority could be some other kind of religion and you could be and would be protected. And, and so that process was a very important process. And as Dr. Friedman pointed out, he used to have this, this phrase, he used to say, I'm paraphrasing him a little bit, but he said the other thing that was very important about the Constitution was that the Founding Fathers realized that the further your tax dollars traveled, the less efficient they were. So in other words, if you look at some of the data I'm going to show you in a few minutes, the argument was that we should have a strong, a powerful, but limited central government, and most of the spending and most of the revenue should be confined to local government and to state government. And we called that federalism. So we said, there's no way the government's going to be able to regulate how people treat each other. As, as much as my grandfather had problems with Italians, logical or not, the point is individuals would work those things out over time. And as long as they're not doing harm to each other, that's really not the role of government to determine who you like or who you associate with. But what is important is that the government sets the framework to protect people 
and secondarily, to provide an environment that business can prosper to its ultimate degree if human beings are given that opportunity. And it also is something that, again, argued for leaving the decision-making process as close to where the consumer, or I'm sorry, the taxpayer lives as is humanly possible. So in other words, I'm in a local community. I know best how my tax dollars are serving me, good or bad, in my local community. I don't see it as much at the state level, and I'm certainly not as well informed as to how my tax dollars are being spent federally. So the argument was, let's keep tax dollars as local as is humanly possible. Now, the other thing that I think is important, and we'll talk about this particular slide into the future, is that there's this very strong correlation between the money supply and inflation. And what I'd like you to just make note of is that there are three ways to finance government. And write this down. You tax, you borrow, or you inflate. And we're going to come back and look at that a little bit later. But when you're talking about financing government, you tax, you borrow, or you inflate. Okay? Now, this is not a hockey stick in honor of the Detroit Red Wings. This is another fact that um, I, I think we all need to take a close look at. If you look here at this chart, from 1776 to early 1982, the United States ran up a, a national debt in just under 206 years of a trillion dollars. From 1982 to date, our national debt has gone from one trillion dollars to 15 point, almost eight, we're just shy of 15.8 trillion dollars. So in 206 years, we've run up a trillion dollar national debt, and then in the last 30 years, we've added almost another 15 trillion dollars. So the argument is, we don't mess around this generation. Uh, we have uh, uh, um, certainly, as we take a look at it, been, in my opinion, rather irresponsible in terms of the size and growth of government and the size and growth of the national debt as a percent of GDP. Now, the next thing uh, to take a look at here with this slide is that as you look at it and as you analyze uh, where we are today, the other thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you look at total gross interest on the national debt, meaning when you look at what's happening relative to the funding of the national debt, uh, first and foremost, if we were looking at this from the point of view of a, a bank, and if we loaned you money, uh, the bank would technically say that the federal government is in default. Because simply what's happening is the federal government has for decades been making no payment on principal, it's just paying interest on the national debt. And gross interest on the national debt is over $400 billion. Uh, this coming year it's estimated that gross interest will be about 425 and net interest will be about uh, 225 billion. Th this past, this year that we're, we just finished, it was uh, about 215 billion dollars. And what I'm saying to you is if you look at the bottom part of that chart, right now one of the, one of the few benefits of this difficult economy that we're in is that the average blended interest rate is 2.95%. And the thing that's important is that you understand that there are at least two major scenarios that could take place. So if you look at an interest rate, write these three points down. Three component parts of an interest rate. Time preference, debtor's risk premium, inflationary risk premium. And what that means is that interest rates follow inflation. If you remember the late 1970s that uh, ended Jimmy Carter's time as president and brought Ronald Reagan to the presidency, one of the real problems was that President Carter uh, didn't seem to be able to fight inflation very well. And as inflation went up, so did interest rates. If you ask your parents 
uh, they were probably, if they took out a, a mortgage in the late 70s, 80, 81, they were paying double digit interest rates for their mortgage. And that was largely due to inflation. So when inflation goes up, interest rates go up. So if we, like many people believe, are moving into a period of high inflation, then what you're going to start to see is that the interest cost of financing the national debt will go up. So just imagine that um, the national debt stays at roughly $16 trillion and interest rates go to 6%. Because these are, these are blended rates that are revised upwardly on, on a, you know, basically two to three year cycle. So the point is, let's say they go to 6%. All of a sudden, instead of having a gross cost of interest on the national debt of $400 billion, we're talking $800 billion. And you realize that right now the interest that America is paying on the national debt is basically larger than the entire GDP of Switzerland. We get to $800 billion, $900 billion, we're talking about one of the top 10 economies in the world that we'd just be paying interest on the national debt. And so as you take a look at it, let's look at another scenario. Let's say it's not inflation. Let's say the economy recovers, and it recovers in a robust way. Well, when the economy recovers, the demand for money goes up, interest rates go up. And let's say the interest rates go up, and it's, and it's a, a, a recovering economy. The point to make in either of these cases is that the interest rate goes up. You could cut $400 billion dollars out of the national budget and be no better off because the higher interest cost from the, uh, from the national debt because of, again, the interest rate cost. So there are two issues with the national debt. First issue is that the national debt is taking a lot of capital out of the economy. But secondarily, the interest cost uh, could be very problematic uh, uh, into the future, much more so than it already is today. So as you look at as you look at the uh, the, the data here, it, it's important then to start to analyze the cost or the size and scope of government. And these next few slides for you to take a look at. These slides are important because. When uh, you bring up Dr. Haywood or my dear friend Dr. Ebling, we have these conversations on a regular basis. And I, I argue that I'd love to go back to 1900, where government at all levels consumed roughly 7% of GDP. And Richard calls me a socialist because uh, I, I'm saying that government consuming 7% of GDP, uh, I'd love to go back to those days. And he gets very um, emotional and talks about the good old days being 1800, 1820, 1830, when government at all levels consumed 3% of GDP. And so what I think is important in a big part of the question, can capitalism and the American dream survive, a big part of it is, how large should government be? And, and a lot of people would say, well, Nash, look, 7.8% in 1902 was too little. And I might even agree with them. I might say, you know, the economy's changed, things are more complex. But the, the second point is, I think we can all agree that today, 40, soon to be 41% of GDP is too high. If you go back to that first chart with the, the macro flow, households, government, and business, the problem today, ladies and gentlemen, is as government takes more and isn't productive in the sense of producing GDP, producing productivity, producing wealth, as government consumes more of that, the private sector has less money for investment, less money to create jobs. And there is the great debate today. And that's why it was so important uh, to have somebody like Maurice McTeague. You know, Dale and I were, were talking about the, uh, this again this morning. If you remember, there's a chapter in When We Are Free by Maurice. 
And, and, and he is a person that Dr. Matchek and I have admired for a long time. And uh, Maurice and I were on, the, on an ALEC program uh, that uh, Jonathan Williams uh, leads uh, for the American Legislative Exchange Council. And it was amazing to watch how Maurice's talk resonated with literally more than a thousand state senators and state representatives from across the country. Because he had this message of optimism. He had this message of we can make a difference, we can change this. And if they can make the changes they made in New Zealand, where their economy was in far worse shape than ours, we have to have the courage to go out there and make a difference. But before we can go out there and make a difference, we need to realize that there's a problem. A lot of people in this country don't realize that there's a problem. A lot of people don't realize where wealth comes from. A lot of people don't realize that government today is dramatically different than it was in the heyday of, or the takeoff phase of growth and the creation of the greatest economy in the history of the world. In the 1800s, government consumed somewhere between an average of 3 to 5% of GDP. And in the early 1900s, it was well under 10%. And today, it's over 40% and growing. And again, that's the debate. We have to ask the question, is government too large? And I don't think it's a question of opinion. I think the answer is yes. Government is too large, and we need to do something about it. And as you look at these next few slides, you look at um, revenue, you look at expenditures, if you look at how money was spent in, in, the, uh, uh, in the 1800s, in the 1900s, how government uh, allocates money today, it, it gives you a breakdown. And, and for those of you that are doing uh, uh, papers, if I can help you out in any way, uh, I have a tremendous amount of data. As I said, uh, all this is on the website, uh, our website. And there's a lot more information. But it, it's interesting to look at the breakdown of, again, tax revenue, spending, and then as, as we go through and we start to, to take a look at or, or as we analyze uh, a, a number of issues, one of the things, if you go back to uh, the, the, the chart with the national debt itself, you know, there are a lot of people that say, well, there's public debt and there's private debt. And I have, have some colleagues that I have tremendous respect for that argue, well, it's really not the total national debt that, that's the issue, it's the public debt. And what I think is important is that you understand why I think it's the total national debt. Public debt, meaning money that the government owes others, maybe they owe your pension fund, maybe they own the bond, they owe the bond that you hold, they owe a foreign government. Public debt is roughly 10 trillion of the of the 15 point roughly eight trillion dollars of national debt so public debt is what we owe individuals other countries institutional investors roughly 5.8 give or take a few hundred billion is what what's called intergovernmental holdings so one government entity owes it to another government entity so maybe um, the highway transportation department borrowed from social security or, or a, a, a Medicare borrowed from or loaned out to another group. But the fact of the matter is, just because the government owes it to another entity of government, it still is owed. And it's one of the reasons why we're constantly raising taxes, because the umbrella called Social Security, with retirement, Medicare, and Medicaid, is, is, is underfunded. One of the, there are two reasons why Social Security is constantly in trouble. Most recent report came out and said that Social Security, if we don't raise taxes again, Social Security will go bankrupt by 2025 or sooner. Is because two factors. One, I, I make the joke as a Catholic, there are fewer Catholics out there. And what I mean by that is the average family is, is shrinking. You know, my wife comes from a family of mom and dad and six kids. I come from a family of mom and dad and nine kids. 
And where I grew up, not too, many, not too far from here, went to St. Mary's of Redford, you know, they used to accuse my mother of being on the birth control pill because in my neighborhood we had a family that had 17 kids. We had another family, same neighborhood, 14 kids. The Franklin family, Catholics that traced their roots all the way back to Ben Franklin, 22 kids, same mom and dad. I'm 54 years old. And today you look at the average size of a family in the United States, it's declined quite a bit. And so as a result, you have fewer people that are going into the workforce, fewer people that are going to be paying into Social Security. When Social Security started, ladies and gentlemen, there were 22 people paying into the system for every one person receiving. Today, it's about two people paying in for every one person receiving. And the biggest problem is all the money that was supposed to be accumulated into these trust funds was spent someplace else. And I think it's important, as I said before, when corporations do something wrong, when they're immoral and unethical, when they do things against their standard practices or their bylaws, they ought to be prosecuted and if need, they need to go to jail. But why don't we hold government to the same standards? You realize if any private company started a system of insurance along the guidelines of Social Security, based on our state laws alone, it'd be illegal in all 50 states. Because it's founded on a, a notion that is not very responsible from a fiduciary level. But if we were taking money from one fund and giving it to another fund and not paying it back, it'd be called fraud. So when we take money from one fund and give it to another fund or don't pay it back or use it to balance the debt and then we, we put at risk future payments of Social Security, why don't we step up and say, that's wrong, you can't do that? You know, how many politicians in your lifetime have said, we're going to make Social Security a lockbox? We'll take care of those dollars. But we haven't, and we have been so dishonest and so irresponsible to you, I'm talking for the most part now to the young people in the room ages 20 to 22, 23. We have not been good stewards. We're putting a huge burden on you for the future because it's a pay-as-you-go system. All this money's coming in, but it's going out. Your private pension funds, your 401ks, they accumulate massive amounts of money to pay the retirement down the road. That's exactly what Social Security was supposed to do. It's never done it. So that's the first problem. We, have a, we, we didn't anticipate that the rate of people paying in to the rate of people receiving uh, was going to decline from 22 to 1 to today 2 to 1. So that, that's, that's a big problem. People are living longer. That's part of the issue as well. Those healthy people, we didn't anticipate that life expectancy was basically going to double during the period of Social Security. And then the second factor is we're promising more and giving out more and more benefits. You know, the first Social Security recipient, a lady by the name of Ida Mae Fuller, she put $30 into the system, which was a lot of money back then. Her employer matched it. She put into the system for three years. And then between the time she retired and began collecting Social Security in 1940, she was the first recipient. She put $30 in. Her employer matched it for a total of $60. And before Mrs. Fuller died in the mid-1960s, she had collected $25,000. So it was an incredible rate of return. But again, you can't build a financial system on that type of rate of return. Uh, you gave people a lot more than they ever put in as it relates to the system. So this is that intergovernmental holdings. This is the money that you're talking about that uh, uh, is, is being loaned or you know, people think disappears in the clouds, if you will. But these are still obligations that we have that we're holding future uh, uh, generations accountable for. So it's important to look at public debt uh, uh, as, as well, but that's why I started out giving you the total national debt uh, as it relates to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the economy. And so why don't we do this? With that in mind, uh, I, I think let's take a 10-minute break, have a little coffee, stretch a little bit. We'll come back, finish this, and then we have one more segment uh, 
uh, with a YouTube video. Okay, so we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, everybody, could, could you uh, retake your seats? We're going to get started again. We're going to actually start with a little Q&A. So I want to request that you wait for me to get to you with the microphone because we are recording this and we can't hear the questions unless you use the microphone. So uh, if you've got some questions, raise your hand I'll come by. You ready, Tim? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, many would argue with you that um, the, the bailouts for the automotive industry worked. And I, I'm personally not an advocate for it. but. I was wondering what your take on it would be as if someone came up to you and said, we'll look at General Motors now, we'll look at Chrysler now. What would you say to them? And looking into the future, would you say there's um, backlash towards them on, on what's happened? I, I, would, I think it's a great question. And when you, you know, when you look at bailing out General Motors or bailing out Chrysler, now, for, first of all, for those of us that are old enough, we remember this is the second bailout of Chrysler. And again, I would say to you, I don't think the role of government is to bail out a company. First point. Second point, for all of you that uh, have lived at least a year or two in Midland, what you may or may not know is that the 222nd largest corporation in the world, or in the United States, I should say, Dow Corning, which is roughly a $5 billion company, a global company, very complex company, it, it, it went bankrupt and it went through uh, a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and it never ceased to operate. So the point is, because you go through bankruptcy does not mean that you cease to exist. And, and I think that um, you know, the, the fact that uh, the government, A, put General Motors through bankruptcy, and then the government determined the winners and the losers in the process was just wrong. So I, I reject the notion that General Motors would have ceased to exist. I even reject the notion that General Motors would have ceased across the board to produce. You know, out of the bankruptcy, we, we, we uh, did away with two of the divisions of General Motors. We shut down plants. And my, my greatest problem with the way we handled the bankruptcy with General Motors is that uh, we threw uh, almost 200 years of tradition and precedent in our very precedent-based legal system by we told all of the secured bondholders, which in bankruptcy, you're all bright people, you've all had finance, you've all had business law. When a bankruptcy takes place, the secured creditors and the bond, secured bondholders are first in line. And it's why you hold a bond rather than a stock. Generally, a stock gives you a better rate of return, but you have more security. You sleep better at night because you're a secured bondholder, you should line up first in line. And the government completely wiped out the historical precedent of that and said, too bad. We're wiping all of you uh, uh, off the map financially. And then turned around and said that the government, who was not a secured creditor, got its quote-unquote just due, and we told all the secured billions, 19, 20 billion dollars worth of uh, secured bondholders, too bad. And then we turned around, and again, I'm not pro-union, I'm not anti-union, but then we told the UAW and the UAW pension fund, we're giving you uh, almost 20 percent stake in the company. And, and again, I, I don't think that that was right. So I, I reject the idea that because a company goes through bankruptcy, the company would have ceased to exist. Now, what would have happened is the stock price would have dropped, and it did, and it would have gone close to zero. And maybe a group of you would have gotten together with other investors, and maybe you would have turned around and you would have, you would have purchased a, a stock in the company. And I would argue that maybe more people would have lost their jobs than did, but it would have been a healthier and it would have been a more vibrant uh, General Motors and a healthier and a more vibrant uh, Chrysler. But see, gang, my, I guess my, my final point is, it gets back to my statement about government playing God. And I, and, I, and I mean that in as friendly a word as I can to the Almighty, in the sense that who is going to decide 
what companies we bail out and what companies we don't. What companies we save and what companies we don't. But most importantly, when you see the national debt figures, we can't afford to do that. Whether we should or not is one question. And the second question is, can we afford to do it? And, and at this point, we can't. And we can't continue to add more and more debt uh, uh, to the government and, and to how we're, we're operating as, a, as an economic entity called the federal government uh, of the United States. So I uh, hope that wasn't too long-winded an answer. And, you know, people disagree with me. And, and as Dr. Matchek pointed out, I do a lot of work in the in the automotive industry on top of producing some of you received our monthly economic outlook those of you that are graduating as seniors if if you give me your email address and we'll put you on it uh, that comes out every month but uh, it, it, one of the areas of responsibility that I have at the university is I, I work with uh, uh, with Richard with Dale and with a lot of our uh, members of the faculty and uh, some of our students uh, in producing a lot of different reports. We produce two or three major uh, uh, studies every year for, or every month for the auto industry. We produce uh, leading indicators uh, for the industry. Uh, we produce a lot of um, uh, data in those areas. And, you know, I, I, um, I can tell you that um, I have friends at Chrysler that, <laughs> that, that don't like my position on the bailout. Behind the scenes, a lot of them do, but they won't say it publicly. Uh, yet we still continue to do some work for Chrysler, so that, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, we've uh, had some really good meetings to do uh, some additional work with General Motors, but when I gave a talk uh, uh, publicly uh, uh, and somebody asked me that exact question, you know, I kept thinking, um, what should I say? And, and the only answer was I had to say exactly what's in my heart, and that is that logically we shouldn't be bailing companies out. That's what the purpose of bankruptcy is. So it's, um, I, I know it's not popular in all areas, and I know that some people think we're, we're far better off. Uh, I, I, I don't think it was the thing to do, but what I will say to you is uh, President Obama could make a huge difference by selling all the government interest today. The government should not be holding stock. Government still owns 40% of General Motors. People like me will never buy General Motors stock when the government owns a big chunk of it. And there are a lot of other investors that feel the exact same way. Uh, I, I have a, uh, a soon-to-be nephew-in-law who uh, uh, is pretty high up uh, in engineering at a young age, worked on the Chevy Volt. He and I respectfully have these disagreements. The Chevy Volt would not be in the market today if not for the fact that some people call it General Motors, Government Motors, rather than General Motors. Chevy Volt came to the market too soon. It's not ready. I'm not saying it's not a good product, but the market's not ready for it. And the very definition that we have to give you a $7,000 subsidy to buy a Chevy Volt should tell you that the technology and the product's not ready. So a lot of these decisions that are being made are not being made by the market process. They're being made because of the administration has a noble goal uh, uh, to make us more energy independent uh, and, and to try to have um, uh, uh, more environmentally sound automobiles on the road. But I would say that it's, it's a noble goal in their eyes, but from an economic perspective and even from the perspective of it working most efficiently, it doesn't. The market process uh, uh, will handle uh, issues, including a lot of the environmental issues, better than uh, uh, the government uh, at least is doing right now. One man's opinion. Other questions? The data makes sense. You don't have any questions on the data so far? Okay. Tim, I have a philosophical question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, you said you were pro-consumer. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's true that every person is a consumer, but nobody is merely a consumer. And although you mentioned many wonderful products, uh, did you mean to imply that a society should be judged by the level of consumption? Uh, is that, are you setting up a criteria of consumption as a way to, um, 
d differentiate between prosperous and unprosperous societies? No, no, I, I don't. What I, I hopefully, uh, uh, let me clarify. What I'm saying is in terms of the process of, of selling goods and services, uh, I think that as it relates to those products, I think that it's the consumer that should be making the decision. I, I, I would argue that we ought to protect the right of the consumer uh, to buy what she or he feels uh, uh, is best and to let those individuals decide whether the ideas and the products, the, the goods and services are successful or are not. But you know, but that, that's, that's just one side of what we do. But, but I think even, even in a greater sense, uh, Dale, it, it would be an interesting discussion because I, I would argue, you know, when we decide on our synagogue or we decide on our church or our mosque or we decide to be an atheist and not go to church, those are all to some degree broader based consumer decisions. And, and, I, and I think that, uh, you know, as you look at, uh, you know, a Catholic priest or a Presbyterian minister or a Jewish rabbi or a Muslim mullah, you know, to some degree, if they don't feed their flock, if they don't produce a good service, those consumers are going to go elsewhere. They're go going to, to choose to go to another synagogue or another church. So there, there is a bit of that even in society outside of the traditional economic. Okay? All right. Thank you. Now, as, as, we, as we take a look um, at uh, uh, continuing the, the discussion uh, and, and look at what's, what's taking place today, uh, another factor for us when we ask the question, can capitalism uh, and the American dream survive? I think another factor that we have to take a look at is the size and the percentage and the growth of, of government employees. And if you look at, at this figure, it, it becomes a rather difficult uh, process to understand. And especially if we, we made it a little bit more personal and we looked at it uh, uh, closer to home. And let's say we, we analyze it as it relates to the, the state of Michigan. Again, I am not anti-government, and I am not saying uh, that there, there isn't a, a role for government and that there isn't a role for government to be enlarged in certain areas. I'm also saying to everybody in the room, we need government, and uh, when, when I have students that will ask me, well, Tim, do you think I should go to work for the IRS, or do you think I should go to work for uh, the Department of the Interior, or the Department of whatever, I, I think it's, 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 it certainly is a noble cause, and we want the best and the brightest working for government. But the question comes into play is, do we have too many employees at the governmental level? And, and, and right now, uh, you know, we, we kind of ended talking a little bit about Social Security. I would suggest that um, if, if the topic inter interests you and, and it works with your paper, uh, one or two of you might want to look at comparing our Social Security system to that of Chile. You know, the Chilean economy has been one of the hottest economies in the world for the last 15 years. You know, it's this South American country that uh, was under military dictatorship. Uh, Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys went down there and helped uh, uh, get them uh, on the course to uh, freedom and free enterprise. And they never went through the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, They've uh, privatized their, their Social Security system. So you don't have to worry about whether the government's spending uh, X amount of money or borrowing from the fund because the government doesn't control it. And it's just like Maurice McTeague was talking about how they privatized a lot of things in, in, uh, uh, in New Zealand. Here's this, this uh, a country that, uh, again, has had rapid economic growth, very low inflation, balanced their federal budget, and 20 years ago they were an economic basket case. 
Today we're looking at um, the, the whole notion of do we need a post office? There are thousands, tens of thousands of people that work for the post office. And so when you start to talk about privatizing the post office, or in some cases the argument is should we eliminate the post office? It's a great debate, and it's a debate that you folks understand a lot better than I do, because you're much more electronic oriented. But you step back and you think about it, how much mail do you really need that you get in the mail? And do you need to have mail delivery six days a week? If you had a, a private system, would mail be delivered one day a week? And how would it be delivered? You know, if you got all your magazines on one day, you got all your letters on one day. Some estimates are that uh, if you looked at 1960, and if we sent 100 letters today, based on the same criteria, I'm sorry, if we sent 100 letters in 1960, based on the criteria today, 90 of those 100 are emails, and we only send 10. So the size and scope of the post office uh, uh, you know, the argument is we could save billions of dollars a year and wipe out the billions of dollars in deficit that we subsidize every year because the post office loses money if we just ran the post office differently. And another question that, that people raise all the time is, why don't we advertise on stamps? We put a government uh, a, a building or a politician's picture or, or a bird on a postage stamp, why not, you know, allow General Motors or Ford or Chrysler uh, to put their, their newest automobiles on the stamp and pay us advertising revenue? You know, there have been proposals where, you know, you, the, um, you know they, they were talking about Budweiser, this Bud's for you, on a, you know, introducing a new Budweiser product or, a, you know, Ronald McDonald on a stamp, or companies saying we'll give you free envelopes with advertising on it, and the revenue for the advertising goes to uh, the post office. What I'm saying to you is we've got to think innovatively, and as things change to counter the traditional norms, we should do things differently versus those traditional norms. You know, the, one of the main reasons you had the postal delivery was because of checks. I think it's, they say less than 5% of people today get their checks in the mail. Most people have their checks deposited electronically. So if we're talking about, I think this year the post office is going to lose about $4 billion. The budget for the post office is probably at least that amount. You know, we're talking about a swing of 8 to $10 billion by dramatically curtailing or eliminating the post office. But we have to be open, we have to be honest about how we would do it and, and why we would do it. Okay? Now, this next slide uh, shows you some of the issues that I'm sure you've heard about and been reading about, and that's the, the, the problems that we're facing in Greece and that we're facing in Europe. And I would say to you, in terms of a debt crisis, we're about, um, we're probably about uh, five, four or five years behind uh, what's going on in Europe. And if we don't do something about our deficit, we're going to have real problems. Um, you, you have um, uh, some issues that are also approaching uh, uh, crisis levels in places like Japan. Now, uh, Japan, let's take a look at Japan and then come back to this slide with Europe. The Japanese have a national debt as a percent of GDP of about 220%. And you say, how could that be? How come the, the economy hasn't collapsed? Uh, the Japanese have been very loyal ever since the end of World War II in buying government debt. And they feel that buying government debt, investing in the country, is a good and loyal thing to do. And as long as the, the Japanese uh, 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 citizens will buy the debt and continue to hold the debt, you know, the government can continue to have a rather large deficit and, uh, uh, you know, the people, as long as they're paid on a regular basis, uh, this, this is not a problem. But what the Japanese are beginning to see is that people your age, and quite frankly, people in their 30s and 40s, are not buying the bonds the way their parents and their grandparents have bought the debt instruments. 
And so as, chi as Japanese grandparents and parents pass away, their, their sons and daughters and grandchildren are, are uh, cashing in the bonds. And the, the, the cost of, of floating the bonds is, is going up. And so the argument is that if you don't have outsiders that are willing to hold Japanese debt instruments or people within the country, that we're looking at a debt bubble in Japan in the next five or ten years that could, could really cause some problems in a country that's been in recession probably 11 of the last 12 or 13 years. Japanese economy has not been a strong performing economy the way it was in the 70s and 80s and, and into the early 90s. So that, that's a problem uh, uh, that, that um, really deserves a close look. If we look at the immediate problem in the world, it's Greece. The U.S. stock market's been down yesterday for the seventh day in a row. Our stock market's lost about 1,000 points in, in the last, um, you know, less than a month. And it's, it's over what's happening in Europe. And it's not just Greece. You, you've heard of the term pigs, P-I-I-G-S. Portugal, Italy, um, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. And, uh, and then as you take a look at it, one of you just said France, and France is one that's, um, you know, I don't know what, what word we get out of it if we have to add F uh, 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 instead of pigs, but um, the fact of the matter is there are some real potential problems in, in France as well. But the thing that's important is you look at, for example, Greece. Greece is roughly 160%. Their national debt is roughly 160% of GDP. And the government's having a really hard time selling its debt instruments. Uh, citizens don't want to buy it, buy those instruments. Outsiders don't want to buy those instruments. And right now, as you look at the problems that you have in Greece, is that, again, if you look at government, there are three ways to finance government. You tax, you borrow, or you inflate. Uh, the the uh, Greeks have among the highest personal and corporate tax rates in the world. Their national debt is 120 or 150, 160 percent of GDP. So they're, they're really in debt and people are not likely to buy their debt instruments. And if they do buy them, they want a much higher rate of return because they think the risk of being paid back is high. So historically what the Greeks would do is they would inflate. They would say, we're just going to print money. The old currency before they joined the European Union was called the drachma. They would print more money, they would create inflation, and they would pay you back in a lower valued currency. So they would export the cost of inflation to other people and other countries. But see, right now the Greeks can't do that. They don't have their own currency. They're part of the European Union. They're part of what we call the Euro. So as long as the European Central Bank won't inflate, the only choice that the Greeks have because their taxes are high. People would protest higher taxes. Their national debt is so high, people aren't buying their debt instruments. They can't inflate because they're part of the euro, so they're engaged in what we call austerity measures. They're cutting government spending, which is exactly what they should be doing. They need to reduce the size and scope of government. But if you, if you paid attention, there's rioting in the streets. They've burnt government buildings down. Uh, they have unemployment over 20% because so much of their economy is controlled by the government. If we're at 40% of GDP at local, state, and federal, the Greeks are at 55 to 60%, which means 6 in 10 jobs are directly or indirectly uh, caused by the government. And, and so it, it's a very difficult situation that they're in, and it's a very difficult situation that they're facing relative to to uh, their future. And, and what's happened all across Europe is that the governments that agreed to reduce debt by cutting back government spending, or what, what they're calling austerity measures, they're losing left and right in, in the recent elections. And they're the, the more what we would call conservative, fiscally responsible governments are being voted out and the governments that are coming into power are basically saying we're going to raise taxes if we can and if not we're going to inflate. We are going to print money 
and we're going to pay off our debts with money that has less value. And if you remember, if you remember from studying monetary economics, that's exactly what happened in Germany before Adolf Hitler came to power. And what happened was prices started to double and triple in a day. You would go into a restaurant in, in Germany and they would ask you, once you placed your order, to pay before your food came because the prices could go up 50, 60 percent. I mean, literally, if, if you were an econ major and you took monetary theory, uh, when I used to teach it, we had a book by uh, Miller and Pusinelli. And there was a segment in the book that showed this little old lady going through the, the streets of, of, um, of Munich. And, and I used to um, joke around about the fact that um, you, you would go through the streets of, um, uh, she would go through the streets of Munich and she had this wheelbarrow. And she was walking through crowded city streets and nobody was bothering her. And again, this was this wheelbarrow full of money, full of what they called uh, Reichmarks at the time, or Deutschmarks at the time. And um, uh, the, she gets to the store, she goes inside, she comes back out, and she has a loaf of bread. But that's how devalued the currency became. She had millions of units of currency and she could buy a loaf of bread. They had another picture in the book of this prominent uh, 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 of, uh, German businessman lighting a cigar with a, a thousand uh, mark note because it was worth hardly anything. People were wallpapering their walls, starting fires with the currency because it had lost its value. Now, I'm not saying that we're at that point even in Greece, but the whole notion of inflation or printing more money to pay off your debts is wrong, it's irresponsible, it's a cruel and hidden tax. When you print more money and the economy, the productivity stays the same, prices go up. And so we blame business people for the higher prices when they have nothing to do with it. And it, it, and it is a major, major problem. But watch over the next year, maybe, or two, maybe less than a year, I think you're going to see a lot of these countries that cannot manage their budgets in a responsible way in Europe, they are going to resort to getting out of the euro. They're going to go back to their own currencies. And the reason they're doing it is they want all three of those options. They want to tax, they want to borrow, and they want to be able to inflate. They want to be able to print more money uh, to pay off their debts in a way that we would say is not moral and is not ethical. And quite frankly, it's a, few, it's a picture for uh, the United States to look at as to what our policies will be if we don't start to get our uh, deficit under control. And, and, and I guess, uh, you know, as you look at some of these issues, the national debt at 100% of GDP is a problem. But after World War II, it was almost 128% of GDP. We liberated uh, uh, with our allied friends, Europe, but it cost a lot of money. We went into tremendous debt uh, to fight the tyranny of Nazism and fascism in Europe and, and to, uh, to defeat the, uh, the, the, the Japanese in, in, in the Pacific arena. But by the time Ronald Reagan became president, the national debt as a percent of GDP was down to 35 percent. So over a, 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 a period of you know, roughly 25 to 30 years, we dramatically and systematically grew the economy and reduced the national debt as a percent of GDP. So even in this country, we have a rich history and tradition of being able to do it, but we have to put our minds to it and realize that it's a problem because if we don't, we're going to have the same kinds of problems that, uh, that the Europeans are, are, are facing. Okay? So now, as, as you start to look at uh, a, a number of different um, uh, variables and you start to look at taxes, uh, the, the, the next set of slides that you're going to look at are, are slides relative to looking at corporate uh, uh, income taxes by country. 
And, and you can read through the handouts, and, I'm, and, and if you have any questions when we do our second round of Q&A, uh, I'll certainly entertain those. But the, the thing that I think is important here is that as you look at the, the, the issues or as you look at the data, the United States um, has some real problems uh, in, in a couple of categories. And, and so as, as we look at um, taxes, uh, there are two things that I think you need to at least think about here in the United States. Uh, number one, uh, at the end of April, we went from having the second highest corporate income tax rate in the industrialized world to having the dubious distinction of now being the country with the highest corporate income tax rate in the industrialized world. Meaning of all our major competitors, we're now number one. And it's not a good number one to be. First point. Second point, I've said this uh, for many years as, as, a, as a teacher. I think probably the most important word in economics is the word relative. And I don't mean your brother, your sister, your cousin, your aunt, your uncle. I mean in comparison to. And that's something that we forget. Because if we're out there competing from one state to another, or from one country to another, you gotta remember that people are comparing the opportunity to do business in your state or your country relative to other countries. So it's important to understand that our corporate tax rate really hasn't gone up or gone down at all in the last decade or more. But what's happened, ladies and gentlemen, is around the world, a lot of people have studied the economic policies of, of Friedrich von Hayek, of Milton Friedman, of George Stigler, uh, uh, of uh, Gary Becker, of, uh, of uh, Ludwig von Mises. You, you, the list goes on and on of the free market economists in the United States. And they've inspired these countries to reduce the size and scope of government, to cut back taxes. So we didn't become the highest tax country in the industrialized world because we raised taxes, we became the highest because other countries said, you know what, our taxes are too high, let's cut them. And the Japanese were number one and they cut their rates by about 2% and now we're number one and they're number two. And they're already talking about another tax cut. And the thing that I think is really important for us to take a look at is our tax rates are a substantial amount higher than Russia, which is at 16%. Former communist country now has a top corporate income tax rate of 60 per, or 16%. Ours is a little over 39%, if you look at the average of the federal and the state combined. China, you know, 20 years ago, when I was in China, it was an economic basket case. Nobody, nobody thought the Chinese economy was going to do anything other than uh, continue to have the vast majority of its people live in poverty. I remember in 1989 traveling down a Chinese highway in which there were hardly any cars on the road at all and there were millions of bicycles in Beijing and in Shanghai. And today it's bumper to bumper traffic and their top corporate income tax rate I think is 24 percent. Ours is again a little higher than 39 percent. So people say, well, the Chinese, you know, they have the lower wages, et cetera. Their wages are increasing dramatically. Their regulations are coming down dramatically, but their tax on business is about half ours. Not quite, but there's a substantial difference. The German tax rate, in the last 10, 11 years, they've gone from over 50% to just below 30%, and they're talking about lowering it to 27%. So when we look at our ability to compete, that becomes a key, that becomes a key factor. And so if you look at this chart and you look at Europe, and then we'll come back and we, we look at taxes. The reason why Europe is really, really important for us, the reason why a healthy Europe is important for us, uh, in 1900 we exported about 2% of our GDP. Today we export about 15% of our GDP. And by far and away, our largest trading partner is Europe. And an unhealthy Europe means 
fewer American exports and harms American jobs, harms the ability to generate wealth in the United States. That's something that we don't have as direct a control on. But when we start to look then at taxes, both corporate and personal taxes, we have an issue because we're number one in corporate income taxes, and that's a problem. That is not inviting for companies to be here and to do business. And as we point out in the document, you know, there, there's a difference between a territorial system and a worldwide system. There are other competitive disadvantages, uh, like, you know, for example, if you're a Dow Chemical and um, you're, we're on a worldwide tax system. So if Dow earns a million dollars at a plant in Ireland and they bring the million dollars back to the United States, it's subject to our corporate income tax rate minus whatever they paid in taxes in Ireland, which is a 12% tax rate. If you're BASF, their largest competitor globally, a giant German chemical company, BASF pays the 12% in Ireland. When they bring it back, because they're a territorial system, not a worldwide system, when they bring that money back to Germany, they pay no additional taxes. So on top of our rates being high, we're unfavorable because we're a worldwide system versus a, a territorial tax system. So as you look at it, our corporations are at a disadvantage, and then we go around and we say corporations don't pay their fair share in taxes, and it's not true. And my, my one big gripe with President Obama is he makes his point by exception. He brings up one or two companies that don't pay their fair share in taxes, whatever that means. Instead of talking about the fact that in terms of averages, we are number one in terms of the rate, and even with write-offs, we're one of the highest taxed corporate entity type organizations in the world. And then we start to talk about rich people and rich people paying their fair share in taxes. Again, it's not true. We don't sit up and talk accurately about the fact that as you look at some of the additional data on personal income taxes, based on the latest IRS data, which is a couple of years old, but notice it's IRS tax data. If it, co it comes from the federal government, from President Obama's Internal Revenue Service, and if you can't believe them, who can you believe? But it's that data. It's pure facts. The last year that we have final tax data on, which was two years ago, the top 1% of taxpayers paid 40% of the income taxes. Top 1% paid 40%. Top 10% paid 70% of the income taxes. The bottom 50% paid 2.9% of the personal income taxes. And if you want to talk about the really well-to-do, the top one-fifth of 1% 1 paid 21% of the income taxes. And that's based on IRS tax data. So either the president needs to do a major overhaul of the IRS and fire a lot of those rascals that are reporting this, or before he gives a talk, he needs to spend a little bit more time looking at the hard, cold, objective data that the IRS produces. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is when we stand up there and we say, corporations don't pay their fair share, and we're trying to rally the crowds. It goes back to my first slide. We create this anti-business mentality that's wrong. It's wrong because we shouldn't be killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. But more important, it's just not true. It's inaccurate. You don't make policy by exception. The vast majority of corporations stay here, love this country, but pay a lot of money in taxes and could be paying a lot less in other countries. And rich people, God bless them. Because rich people go out there, they take risks, they earn money, they create jobs, and they also pay a disproportionately high amount of money in taxes. And that's why I, I'm so passionate about this idea 
that uh, uh, we're, we're, we're bringing into play the longevity of the American dream. We're bringing into question the longevity of the American dream because we're telling half-truths or things that are not true. Businesses pay at least their fair share in taxes. Rich people, those one percenters, which I hope everybody in this room wants to be one of those one percenters, those one percenters pay a disproportionately high amount of their revenue in taxes. And the real question that I would ask you is, is it not the case that instead of saying we have a tax problem and we have an issue with people paying their fair shares, I would say we have a problem with spending. And we have a problem with how effectively we use or spend those dollars that we, in fact, uh, bring in. Now, that's taxing, that's borrowing, that's inflation. These next couple of slides uh, have you take a look at regulations. And if you look at um, these slides here, if you go back, these are slides of the Heritage uh, uh, Foundation, Wall Street Journal Freedom End Index, and the Cato Institute Fraser Index. Cato, uh, Wall Street Journal, we all know the Wall Street Journal, Heritage Foundation is a major think tank. Uh, uh, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Cato Institute's another think tank. The Fraser Institute uh, is, is Cato's Washington-based. Fraser is a Canadian think tank. And what's important is their Freedom Index measures the level of taxes in an economy and measures the level of regulations in an economy. And as you go through these couple of pages of charts, what you see, and this is something that, that uh, Morris was referring to yesterday, what you, what you see is that the United States has gone in the last 20 years from number two to number 10 and falling rapidly. And we've fallen dramatically in the last four years. Whereas countries like New Zealand weren't in the top 50 20, 25 years ago. And New Zealand it came out in March, they're now number four because they've systematically been cutting back the size and scope of government. Balanced their budget for more than 15 years in a row. A lot of you in this room that are seniors at Northwood, you probably remember what it was like, especially if you grew up here in Detroit, going across the Ambassador Bridge or through the Windsor Tunnel over to Canada. And it wasn't too many years ago when one Canadian dollar equaled 71 U.S. cents. The Canadian economy was in a shambles. Mr. McTeague was one of the advisors uh, and, and still consults with the Canadian government in telling the Canadians about what they did in New Zealand to reduce the size and scope of government. But Canada very quietly has cut their corporate income tax rate. They've cut their regulations kept regulations, sound ones in key areas, like some good regulations in banking that, that we got rid of uh, under President Clinton that, in my opinion, we shouldn't have, at least in the way that we did, which led to part of the problems with the financial crisis. But Canada has gone from number 15 on that Freedom Index to now number 7. And they're moving in the right direction. The Canadian dollar in the last year, it's traded like 16 times at a penny above the value of the U.S. dollar. So they've gone from 71 U.S. cents equals a Canadian dollar to now saying, well, if you want a Canadian dollar, it's going to cost you 101 U.S. cents to get a Canadian dollar. And, and so the, the, the key is that there are examples all around us of, of what we can do to do things better. Uh, this next chart, we, we took a look at a lot of different studies. And this chart takes a look at local taxes, state taxes, federal taxes, and the cost of regulation. The higher prices you pay for goods and services uh, as it relates to uh, regulations. And as you go through and you look at these charts, uh, what's important uh, uh, to understand is that you work until mid-August to pay off the average American some pay less, some pay more, but if you look at taxes on average, et cetera, uh, you look at uh, the average American works until mid-August to pay for 
taxes and the cost of regulations. So again, it's another way of measuring uh, the, the size and scope of government. Yeah, you know, Dr. Hayward used to say, if you, complete freedom is if you earn a dollar, you get to keep a dollar. You know, other economists are saying, let's measure it in years or in, over the, 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 the uh, weeks and months, days, weeks and months of a year. And how much do you really work for yourself versus working for uh, the government? So as, as you go through and you look at where we are today, I'm sure all the students in the room re re um, recognize this as the Laffer Curve. Uh, Arthur Laffer, a famous American economist, advised John F. Kennedy, uh, advised Ronald Reagan. And uh, uh, Arthur Laffer argues that um, he argues for a flat tax. I'm not saying that a flat tax is the solution. But what Dr. Laffer pointed out, and this was really part of his uh, uh, dissertation uh, uh, from Yale University, he said there's an optimal tax rate. And, and he argues that uh, we should do away with all exemptions, all deductions, and have a flat rate tax of roughly 14 to 15 percent. And uh, for those people that make below a certain level of income, uh, they wouldn't pay to any taxes on their first 15 to $20,000 in income. And then it would go to 15 percent, and uh, uh, that would be the flat rate tax. And his argument is that once you go uh, below 15 percent, uh, businesses could afford to pay more and should pay more. When you go above 15 percent, the tax is too high and it starts to drive businesses out of business. And what I'm saying is, and the only reason I put this up here is just to get you to think. You know, there, there's the fair tax. People argue, let's do away with all taxes and just have a national sales tax. The argument there is you could eliminate the IRS. And there's a lot of debate. Some people say, oh, you know, if we go to a flat rate tax, you do away with all exemptions, all deductions. that too many people would oppose it. The accounting industry would be against it because all these accountants would be out of work. The legal profession would be against it because all these lawyers, tax lawyers, would be out of work. They argue Jewish rabbis, Catholic priests would be against it because we're, would they really continue, would the parishioners continue to give to their religious entities if they didn't get the tax write-off? I would hope that, that we all would. But the point is, we have a tax system that's incredibly complex. Uh, I remember when we used to have the CCH, the, the tax code, every year. And I would go over to the library when I was the academic dean. I'm about 6'1", and I have long arms, long hands, and my wingspan's about 6 foot 6 inches. And I couldn't touch both ends of these books that had the tax code for the year. And every year we'd get a new set of books because the tax code would change every year. And you'd have research scholars looking at what the tax code actually meant. And, and I can't use that as an example. I used to have this picture that when I gave speeches, I would show myself in the library, and, and there was about six inches more books than my, I, I couldn't touch from end to end all these books on the tax code. And now the problem is I can't do that because they all come out on a computer disk. And, and, you know, we don't print the books anymore. They're a lot more readily researchable as disks than they were with the books. But my point is, think about all this, you know, the small library of books just to have the tax code, and it changes or changed every year. And so if you did away with that, you could dramatically change the complexity of things. You could dramatically simplify business. Uh, a, a good friend... Uh, Leo Limbeck and uh, Bob McNair. Leo's a big construction uh, uh, leader in, in uh, Houston. Bob is uh, uh, the owner of the Houston Texans. They're, they're behind a movement for a fair tax. Uh, you know, their argument is uh, let's have a national sales tax. Their argument is let's do away with all income taxes. Let's do away with uh, a Social Security tax. Let's do away with the tax on income. Let's incorporate it all into a national sales tax. But again, the question is, do we have a tax system that most effectively uh, collects taxes and, and most efficiently uh, uh, reduces the burden of preparing and paying taxes? 
And, and I would argue the answer is no. But we have to have an open dialogue, ladies and gentlemen, as to how we structure taxes and what's the most efficient, the most effective way uh, to tax. And in, the, in this country, we have a very onerous tax system, a tax system that very few people understand. My wife's much smarter than I am. I'm a fairly smart person. And, and uh, you know, you, we, we take a large amount of time just preparing all the information for our tax preparation. And, you know, finally I said, yeah, I'm going to sleep a lot better and I'm going to have a lot more free time. We have a wonderful Northwood grad who, who passed her CPA on the, on the first uh, attempt, Diane Momi, and uh, she does our taxes. Uh, uh, she's a great uh, CPA. And, um, you know, it, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a situation where when I've asked Diane, you know, what would this mean? And she said, yeah, you know, a, a part of the, the, our business is, is, is tax. But she said, you know what, companies could afford to, uh, to hire us and we could be consultants in, in helping make their business more effective, more efficient. You're still going to audit businesses. You know, privately or publicly held businesses still want a CPA or an accounting firm to audit their financial statements to make certain that they don't have internal fraud, etc. So it doesn't mean you do away with the accounting profession. It just means that there's fewer accountants in that area of the profession. But what it means is you could save tens of billions of dollars if you reduced or, or eliminated the, the IRS by having a simple, more pro-business uh, uh, system of taxes, which many countries around the world have done, as, uh, as Morris noted uh, last night. In terms of um, uh, the, the economy today, I think the biggest problem that we have is uncertainty in the United States. Can capitalism and the American dream survive? The answer is absolutely yes. But the real question is, will people have the courage and the knowledge to stand up and argue and ask the right kinds of questions? Have this debate, have a, a, a very responsible dialogue with your neighbor, with your friend. Adopt a Democrat, adopt a Republican, adopt a union member, adopt a business friend. You know, whatever your, whatever your position is, don't hold it so sacred that you can't have a dialogue with somebody that you think you disagree with. Because what you're going to find out is that you really agree with them in most areas. But then have this discussion about what it's going to take to make a difference. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the governor of of, uh, uh, of uh, Indiana, huge fan of the governor of Wisconsin, big fan of our governor, because they have the courage to make change and make it on principles, sound principles that are driving the production of goods and services. I think that today our biggest problem is, in, in one sense, people don't realize that our national debt's a problem. They don't realize where we're at relative to Greece and Spain and Italy on the negative side, and they don't realize how tough it is for us to compete from a tax perspective against India or against uh, uh, China. You know, India's top corporate income tax rate, for what it's worth, is 30%, you know, almost a full you know, nine points below ours, or a little over nine points below ours. So we have to have that dialogue, because right now, in the United States, I would say the biggest problem is the following. Corporations, by and large, in the last five years have dramatically reduced their debts. You look at income statements, balance sheets of corporations, they're very healthy. Corporations are holding uh, a couple of trillion dollars in cash here, and the international corporations, depending on whose data you look at, are holding somewhere between $1 and $2 trillion outside of the country because if they bring it back in, our tax system punishes them unduly versus their competitors in other countries. The German companies bring it back in because there's no tax. They paid the tax in the territory they operated in, and they bring it back to the country with no additional taxes. If you're General Motors, if you're Dow Chemical, if you're DuPont, 
you pay the taxes in that country and then you pay more when you bring it back into the country. So the incentive is to grow your company outside of the U.S. Maybe produce the products, bring the raw materials or certain products into the U.S. Uh, because that's the way the tax code benefits you. So we need to have that discussion about our competitive advantages and disadvantages. I think today that consumer confidence is waning because unemployment's high. Because the biggest problem that we have today is the rate of labor force participation. These are the people that are, that are uh, 18 years of age and older that have worked as a percent of the population. Uh, if we had more time, I'd go through and tell you about U3 versus U6 unemployment. Uh, uh, some of that's uh, in the... Uh, in, in uh, the report, uh, the economic report that, uh, that I gave. And even if you didn't get one, if you go to our website, that's on the website as well if it interests you. But the problem is you're finding more and more people that are adversely impacted by this recession. More and more people have given up on looking for a job. Our labor force participation, the percent of people eligible to work 18 and above that are working, is at its lowest rate in 40 years. The unemployment rate, once you go off unemployment, you're not calculated in there. There are a lot of people that have simply given up working that would like to have worked, couldn't find a job, and once they give up, they're not counted in the unemployment rate. That's one of the reasons why consumer confidence is where it's at. Business confidence. Here you have these businesses that are competing in a complex global economy they're competing in a complex global economy, and they're having a hard time with the fact that Washington, this president, is saying we need to increase the tax rate on businesses. And they're thinking, boy, our operation in Europe or Asia is paying less in taxes. We think we're paying too much in the U.S., and the government's get threatening to increase our taxes even more than currently exists. Well, hiring a new employee is a cost of doing business. And if the company has to worry about paying higher taxes, that means they're curtailing or waiting on their decisions to hire more employees until they find out whether or not they're going to have to pay higher taxes. And it's why these elections in many business people's minds are so vital. And then another factor, I mean, it, it, it's, it's uh, I, you know, for all of you in the room that are still students, some of you that are going to be graduating, going out into the workforce, look at what's happened with the president's health care plan. Again, I think President Obama is a good and decent man. I, 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 am, I love to see him interact with his wife, with his kids, being a husband and a father. I, I, I simply disagree with him on, on his policies. And in terms of health care, I, I, I really believe if he had it to do over again, he would have tightened uh, uh, some of the Medicare opportunities, and that would have been it. But the problem with the health care plan is we ramrodded it through because we had the votes in the House and the Senate if we're the Democrats. And the worst thing that could have ever happened when Speaker Pelosi on national TV, when they said, Speaker, could you explain what's in this almost 3,000-page bill? And she laughed, and she said, I guess we're going to have to pass it to find out what's in it. One of the truly irresponsible political statements by a leader, the Speaker of the House, in my lifetime. Because today, gang, people are still trying to figure out what's in it. Years later, as the Supreme Court debates whether they're going to overturn it or not, they're trying to figure out what's in it. What's the cost going to be? What's a Cadillac plan? What's not a Cadillac plan? And there are so many incentives for companies to pay a penalty and put their uh, uh, employees in these government exchange programs, which will clearly lead to greater costs. And what I would say to you is this. You, know, you heard Morris at the, at the end of his discussion last night. The greatest health care system in the world, bar none, is the United States. And it just depends on how you measure it. If you measure it by access, we're not number one. If you measure it by Life expectancy, if you discount for obesity, people like me that, that eat too much, we have the highest life expectancy in the world by three years. 
If you look at survival from cancer, from heart attacks, from diabetes, et cetera, we have, we're the best in the world by a multiple factor. So the fact is we are the leaders in invention in terms of new, new uh, machinery, new products, pharmaceutical patents. We, we, we're well over 80% of them happen here because it's the last bastion for free enterprise and for research and development. We subsidize the rest of the world in terms of pharmaceutical products, medical technology, et cetera. Because it gets here first, we're willing to pay the higher price because we get it first, and then it eventually makes it literally to the rest of the world. If we lead to what most people believe, it's exactly how Canada started out. Oh, you'll have a choice. And then in the 60s, and then they had a, ended up with a national health care system. And what a lot of people don't appreciate is last year, 7,000 Canadians had heart surgery in Michigan alone because their doctors deemed that they needed it and they couldn't get in the queue to have it in Canada. And that, that's a hard, cold fact. Now, the system is not good for about 30 million Americans. But is the government the solution? I would argue if we had a real open, honest debate down the road, we should have true consumer choice, but that's going to take uh, more of a time to have that debate. But in the short run, for those that don't have medical coverage, that can afford to have medical coverage, if they choose not to get it, that's their choice. But the vast majority of people, you could give, you could extend tax credits and cover most people that aren't covered. Instead of creating this huge government bureaucracy, just extend tax credits to those that are in a certain level, and you would cover the vast majority of the people that don't have coverage. The president's plan wants to take care of people that are illegal immigrants. Uh, my opinion is American taxpayers shouldn't be paying for health care of illegal immigrants. But that's a part of that, that figure as well. And quite frankly, a lot of your religious hospitals are going to take care of those people. And if we realize that these are the particulars, these are the issues, charities will take care of those types of uh, difficult situations. And then last but not least, there are laws that can be uh, uh, implemented, changes that can be made as it relates to insurance. I'll guarantee you, most of you that drive a car in Michigan have automobile insurance that's not from the state of Michigan. You probably have life insurance from a company that's not in Michigan. But because of uh, certain uh, uh, vagaries of, of the, the, the political and, and, and economic system, you can't buy health insurance across state borders. Kentucky, which has the lowest cost, if you're a healthy male age 25, you can buy basic cafeteria health care in Kentucky for $1,100. Last time I checked, the highest cost state is New Jersey. Same person buying it in New Jersey, $6,900. Very, very expensive with a relatively high deductible. If you allowed people to buy the insurance across state borders, competition would increase, quality would increase, prices would drop, and a lot of these problems would go away. But instead of saying, let's have market solutions, we were saying the government's the solution rather than, than the marketplace. So what, what I would say to you in, in a nutshell is that um, I, I know with some of the stuff that I've presented to you today, it doesn't, um, it doesn't sound like I'm optimistic. I am extremely optimistic. I am a, a huge believer in all of you in terms of your abilities. I'm a, 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 you know, I bleed red, white, and blue. I, I truly believe this is the greatest country in the history of the world. But I also think we should open our eyes and ears and listen to a lot of people and learn lessons from our friends in New Zealand, from our friends in Canada, from our friends in Chile. We ought to be a lot better, a lot more effective, and a lot more efficient about the things that we're we're doing here. And what, I, what I'd like to do before I close and, and, and um, open it up for, for any questions you might have to make sure we're done at uh, uh, 1130, 
Dale, if you could cue up that YouTube video. There, there's about a five minute YouTube video and then I want to go over that second handout with the federal budget. Okay? But uh, I, I think we're going to be able to play a, a YouTube video here uh, that if you like it, pass this thing on. Uh, a, a friend of mine sent this to me two weeks ago and there were 6,000 people that uh, had viewed this video. And today it's, it's over 600,000 people have viewed it. It's a video by a retired a tax accountant uh, who worked for IBM. And he took a look at the federal budget. Have you ever questioned why Congress does not reduce spending and balance the budget? The answer will shock you. They can't. Not even if they remove every department, employ, as well as the military. I'm Hal Mason, a retired accountant, and have worked with budgets over 40 years. This February, the White House released the United States budget. I was stunned to discover Congress can't balance the budget, even if they shut down the government. The dilemma facing Congress is startling. Watch as you see a budget that can't be balanced. To understand Washington's budget dilemma, we simply click on the President's budget for fiscal year 2013. Page 210 provides 12 years of budget data. We will only look at this year, 2012. Washington will spend $3.8 trillion. However, it will only collect $2.5 trillion in taxes, resulting in a deficit of $1.3 trillion, an amount larger than what Congress appropriates to operate the federal government. Now to explain the dilemma. Government spending is broken down in three simple categories, interest, mandatory programs, which is entitlements and government pensions, and the federal government, which is called discretionary programs. It breaks down the government in two pieces, security related, which includes the military, and non-security, which encompasses any spending that is not related to the nation's security, such as Department of Education, Energy, etc. We simply cross out the federal government and the remaining cost exceeds all tax revenues. The problem is simple. Spending for mandatory programs and interest is greater than the tax revenues collected. Mandatory programs include Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment, and federal pensions. Congress must pay the interest and has promised to pay the pensions and entitlements. So the dilemma they face is that after the checks are processed for mandatory programs and interest, there isn't one dollar left to fund the military or any federal employee department or office. You now understand their dilemma. To balance the budget, Congress would either have to raise taxes 50 percent or eliminate the federal government. If they cut entitlements and pensions, our nation will have riots like Greece. The United States only collects two and a half trillion in taxes. More than half comes from income taxes a third from payroll taxes, and the remaining from excise, estate, duties, and some miscellaneous taxes. These aren't quite enough to even pay for the interest or the mandatory programs. Selecting Historical Table 7.1 reveals a grave problem. Spiraling debt that exceeds 100 percent of the gross domestic product, a liability that exceeds our nation's annual economy. And as I chart the debt, it reveals Washington's uncontrollable addiction to borrowing. The budget projects this year over 16 trillion debt and 26 trillion this decade, soaring debt that has the United States on a path identical to Greece. And if you thought Greece was a problem, the United States has 32 times their debt. 16 trillion is 25 percent of the world's gross domestic product. As Washington is racing toward the cliff, there is no hint of slowing down. And for the first time in our history, the United States has lost its AAA rating on its Treasury debt. Greece provides a preview of what happens when a nation is forced to deal with massive debt. Greece recently was downgraded to the lowest rating on the scale. Investors lost 70 percent in the recent European bailout, and the bailout of bonds are now rated as junk bonds. The question is not if, but when the United States will collapse from the weight of the soaring debt. 
And we need to ask, what are we paying these Washington intellects to do? They have no approved budget. They borrow every dollar to operate, and they estimate debt will soar to $26 trillion. Instead of solving the crisis, they raise the debt ceiling. There is a tipping point where the debt can no longer be sustained. So our nation can either get involved or be buried in the ashes. So you ask what can be done to correct this crisis? The answer is painful. First, Washington must admit the problem. Second, it must explain the problem to everyone. And third, we must face the pain of fixing the problem. It won't be solved by arguing over who pays the highest fares on the sinking Titanic. Everyone is going to feel the pain, as the United States must cut into entitlements, pensions, government spending, as well as get a fair tax code that doesn't cripple the economy. Everyone must vote for representatives who will focus on the financial solvency of the United States. If not, we will all go down with the ship. I think Mr. Mason is generally correct. There are a couple of things that I would um, maybe brighten up the video a little bit with by saying, number one, uh, our debt relative to our GDP is much stronger than the debt of the United States, uh, uh, than that of uh, Greece. But what I think is important is that if you remember from, from when we are free, there's a chapter in there on the fall of Rome and modern day parallels. The thing that's scary is that as countries become more burdened by debt, they dramatically reduce the size and scope of spending. And oftentimes the things that they do is they reduce the budget for their intelligence department like the CIA or the FBI, they reduce the, the funding for the military, and they become less capable of protecting their interests against foreign or domestic peace breakers. And, uh, you know, the the, the uh, budget for the CIA. Some people argue that uh, we fell asleep at the switch. We should have realized when the, the World Trade Center, whether you realize this or not, was bombed in the 1990s. And uh, luckily, it, uh, the, the bombs that were put in the garage below the, uh, one of the Twin Towers uh, created tremendous damage but did not topple the building. A lot of Americans forget that that happened, I think it was 1997. And then when 9-11 took place, you know, the, the argument is our, our intelligence uh, should have caught these things, uh, but we had made some cuts to the, to the budget uh, uh, in, the, in the 1990s that uh, left us more vulnerable uh, and less knowledgeable of what was going on in the, in, around the world and even uh, at, at uh, uh, flight training schools in the United States. And so when you think about the fall of the Roman Empire, here was the greatest economy, the greatest military in the history of the world. But when the Roman Empire fell, the denarius, the, the currency of the Roman Empire, had gone from being 90% silver to less than two-tenths of 1% silver. Soldiers, they used to have soldiers on the wall protecting the borders of the Roman Empire. They would have a soldier every two feet. And uh, uh, by the time the Visigoths invaded uh, Rome, they had one soldier per every 200 feet. And you couldn't stop a standing army from invading. And, and, and so the thing is not to say that tomorrow the U.S. economy is in a peril, because it's not. But the thing is for us to be proactive rather than to be reactive. We have a lot of problems, and we have the greatest economy in the world today. I would say to you, that the vast majority of people have given the opportunity to migrate to the United States uh, uh, around the world, uh, maybe not the vast majority, but a large number would choose to come here because of the traditions and the freedoms and the opportunities. Again, what we need to do is to say, let's deal with these problems, let's deal with them effectively, efficiently, so that we can have the American dream for all the young people in this room, for your children, for your grandchildren, 
But the stark reality is that's the budget for 2012-2013. That's the budget that has been submitted. We are literally saying that the projected tax revenue, even if we eliminated the entire federal government, would still give us an $8 billion budget deficit. That's how out of control things are. And we've gone in your lifetime, heck, you know, for, for most of you in this room, you know, you weren't even born uh, when, when uh, um, uh, you know, many of you weren't born when George Bush the first was president. And, and government, uh, um, the national debt was less than 50% of GDP. Today it's 100%. It's doubled in your lifetime. And you folks haven't been responsible for it. We've been, we have been bad stewards of the budget. We have been bad stewards of your future. And I think what's, my last message to you is this. One of the reasons why young people are disadvantaged is because you don't vote. The lowest group of people in terms of voting. The reason why Social Security pays the kind of money it pays the reason why we keep increasing the, the, the income to people 60 and above, the reason why we keep increasing the benefits is why? Because they vote. 60 and above, you know, it's about 80% of people 60 and above vote in, in, in elections that matter, federal elections. You know, 18 to 25, what percent do you think votes? Less than 20%. And, and it's really important that, um, uh, again, look to the optimism. You, you know, the, and, and, and it's not just the United States. For you, those of you in Canada, heck, we're all going to be moving north, for all of you that are Canadians. There are a number of wonderful European countries that are doing very well. But the fact is, when I say the American dream, I mean it in a generic sense. I mean free people living in free countries that are allowed to prosper by the fruits of their labor and strong decisions. That, had a, that has a government that has a proper role and that allows for the protection of property rights, for the protection against foreign and domestic peace breakers, and that helps set the stage for an economy where entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs create jobs and, and, and create prosperity so that all people are, are, uh, are better off. And, and what I would say to you is I hope when you conclude this Freedom Seminar, you say, A, I had a great experience, and B, at the end of the Freedom Seminar, I'm going to be a better leader, a better manager. I'm going to take my employees uh, on a successful ride. As I prosper, they will prosper with me. But also, I'm going to make my community a better place. I'm going to volunteer. The more volunteerism we have, the less government we need. And then on a political basis, you're going to do the kinds of things to make certain that we have the right people in Washington, or as uh, Mr. Collins would say in his book, Good to Great, we have the right people on the bus in the right seats to turn the American economy around. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. And, and if there are any questions I didn't answer, I think we have a time for a, for a few questions. Yes? No? Go ahead. Um, earlier you said the top 1% of the wealth in the United States is paying their fair share of taxes. But how come people like... One income. income. We're talking about income taxes, yeah. yeah. How come people like Warren Buffett claim that he's paying less, like a lower tax rate than his secretary? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because that is, that is absolutely true. But the thing that you have to remember is that's dividend income. So, so as an example, Warren Buffett paid income taxes. And then, if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, paid taxes on that income. Uh, Warren Buffett pays an income tax. And then on top of all of that, you have a dividend income, which is the third form of income. You know, some people argue, and for a long time, long after the income tax was passed in the 19-teens, there was no tax on investments. The argument is you pay taxes on your income, period. But Warren Buffett is in his, I don't know, mid-80s. And so Warren Buffett, you know, most people when they're Warren Buffett's age are retired. 
and, and a large number of people that are retired have paid their income taxes, and then they have investments. And they have investment income that is based on, you know, largely dividend income. And, and so that is taxed at a lower rate. Now, my problem with Mr. Buffett, and my wife and I own Berkshire Hathaway stock. I've written him a letter. He's never written me back. Uh, but the problem with it is I, 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 he's an exception. And so do we, do we change the dividend tax because Warren Buffett happens to have all of his income that he has in, in essence uh, where most people would be retired as dividend income? I think the answer is no. I, I think that uh, if you look at it, dividend income uh, helps pay for college funds. I would guess that a lot of your parents were able to uh, um, put money away to save and invest and uh, had dividend income that, uh, that pays for your, uh, uh, at least some or all of your college. Uh, maybe your grandparents helped put you through school and uh, they had dividend income at that rate. That dividend income is what spurs investment. It's, it, it generates capital or what we call capitalism. It's that money that people generate that we invest to create jobs and businesses. So, so the, the fact of the matter is uh, he's an exception. He's not the norm. Um, do I want to be Warren Buffett someday? Yes. Does my wife really want me to be Warren Buffett someday? Yes. Uh, do I think that uh, uh, dividend income, I, you know, I'll give you my answer. I think dividend income should be zero. I think you should not pay taxes. We, we double and triple ta tax things in this country. We tax you on your income. Uh, we tax you on your, we tax the corporation on your investment income. And then it's paid to you and then we tax it again. We, we tax things double and triple. And, and, and uh, I, I think he's an exception. But it's a great question. Um, referring to the nationalized health care plan that Obama was coming up with, mm -hmm. <clears throat> when you said illegal immigrants, we shouldn't be paying their uh, health care either like when they go to the hospital and get hurt, or people who don't have health care, who do you expect to eat those costs when they go to the, health, like the hospital and get hurt? Well, you know, it, 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 it's interesting. If, if my talk were on health care, uh, I, I'd, I'd give you a, a much better uh, elongated answer. We have a, a white paper on the web page if you want to read it. It's about 40 pages. I know how excited you all were with the, the charts and the data. But um, uh, what I would say to you is this. If you looked at, in the interest of time, let, let me be brief and then maybe you and I can have a sidebar on this. If you look at what happened um, before World War II, health insurance for the vast majority of Americans and the vast majority of people around the world did not exist. And yet, we had great health care systems. People would pay the doctor for the cost of health care. And you would, you, would, you would pay the hospital, you would work and negotiate with the, the hospital, you would negotiate with, with the, the doctor, the doctor visit. And what happened was during World War II, when there were wage and price controls because of the war, the, the cost of the war, you know, inflation was, was increasing at very rapid rates, uh, companies couldn't pay higher wages. So somebody got the idea of offering health care benefits as a way to attract employees to their business versus other businesses. You know, I think it was Kaiser uh, Steel or Kaiser Permenti that, that, that came up with the original um, uh, program here in the, in the United States. But the fact is that if we can get back to things like medical IRAs, where people are negotiating individually, you would see better care, you would see lower prices. But what is, is really important to, to understand is that, uh, as an example, uh, uh, there are many great Jewish hospitals in the United States. There are many great Catholic hospitals in the United States. There are many great Methodist hospitals in the United States. And historically, these hospitals have always had a percentage of, and they've operated, been successful, been profitable, and they've always taken care of those that could not take care of themselves. They've taken care of, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's between your rabbi, your, your priest, your nun, your minister. But, um, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of illegal immigrants. You know, when I mentioned Italians were called WAPs because they came into the country, a lot of them without papers. 
you know, they, 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 they took care of the, the, the person that needed the health care and didn't turn in the illegal immigrant. But the fact is, we had great health care in this country in the 1800s, in the early 1900s, and we had no uh, 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 means of the government and or uh, uh, health care programs taking care of people. I think we've taken the consumer out of it, but simultaneously these great charities, these great private hospitals took care of people that couldn't pay. And, and people would pay when they could. And, and people might, it might take them a year to pay off their hospital bill, but they did. And I'm not saying that there wouldn't be insurance, because a lot of people would, would want insurance. But there are, when I look at all the money that, that my wife and I have paid into health insurance over the years, and, uh, you know, we, we've, we have four kids, and uh, uh, we've paid a lot more in premiums than we ever would have paid if we had paid cash for the birth of our four children, for, um, you know, the stitches, the, you know, the, the accidents, uh, uh, that, that, that took place along the way. But, you know, we happen to sleep a lot better at night having the insurance. But if, if, if you were the average person, you'd be better off putting money into a medical IRA and paying the cost each time that you go. Uh, you know, as an example, uh, studies show that people that, that don't have a, a cost, that don't have insurance to go to their doctor, but negotiate it with their doctor, end up paying a lower rate. So, you know, they're, they're in some cases, the argument is people go to the doctor too often, use it too much, that prices are inflated because of the insurance. So, it, you know, my answer is twofold. One, I hope I'm answering your question that I think that private charities and the market process would take care of those things, as they do today. But I also think that you, you would, with some of these other solutions, you would reduce the, the dramatic cost inflation. Okay? Any more questions? One more. Um, as you mentioned, and it was already restated about the um, top 10 paying 70% of income taxes and the top one paying a disproportionately high 40% um, of income taxes, and then you led to other suggestions such as the flat tax or the fair tax. Um, I have a kind of twofold question. One, what would you personally suggest? Um, what would your suggestion be for in regards to taxes? And two, um, you mentioned how it would be about 15% for a flat tax. Uh, what do you think it would be for a fair tax? Uh, I, I would prefer, good question, I would prefer uh, my, my personal opinion is I, I would like to see a, a, uh, um, a sales tax, a national sales tax. I, I, would, um, I think that uh, when you tax on consumption, if, if you don't consume, you don't, you don't pay the tax. But the, but the fact of the matter is uh, I think that uh, in that case, in that scenario, uh, you could dramatically reduce, you could save tens of billions of dollars uh, by eliminating the... Um, uh, um, the IRS, or dramatically curtailing the size and scope of the IRS, and and then you would you would uh, you would have a system that would allow you to do away with the payroll taxes that we have. It would allow you to do away with the income taxes, and I think it would not be a disincentive uh, for business. So I, that's what I would prefer, and I think that that tax would probably end up being somewhere between 19 and, and 20 percent. But you would do away with all other, uh, all other taxes. And, and you would have that as a, uh, a consumption tax. And if you weren't consuming certain things, you wouldn't be paying taxes. So unlike some of the criticisms, it would not be disproportionately uh, problematic to, to lower income people. And I think it would create a dramatic uh, a incentive for growth in this country. Think about the fact that what we're saying is we wouldn't have the debate on the Warren Buffett issue because we wouldn't be taxing dividends. We would have no tax at all on corporations. And, and, and we, would, uh, we would do away with the personal income tax. We'd do away with the tax on uh, uh, things like Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid. And, and I think that we would create an environment that would cause this economy to rocket. 
uh, skyrocket forward. I think tax revenue would increase dramatically. And then uh, we would be able to look, uh, I think, a lot more openly and honestly about uh, uh, on that, the topic of what is the proper role of government and, and, and investigate a number of things in the United States the way uh, New Zealand did or the way Canada is currently doing. Any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much.